I'm not making this to justify what I've done, but you'll probably have found the body by now. And this is the last time I can clear things up. No one who kills themselves knows all their motives. At least for me, it's a vague anxiety over the future. For a long time, I've been reflecting on how I've lived and the people I've wronged. I give myself a year to see if life had meaning. Quickly, I don't know. Has anyone come down from, from these blocks? About five months ago, the girl got shot right there. Right there. She got gunned down by tree brothers, push bike, balaclava, youths, kids, babies. This thing is about, this thing is about, we've lost our roots. Yeah? We've lost our roots. You understand? Yeah? Yeah? Let me tell you now, when the girl got shot, you know how much people was getting outside? There was about five of us. You see how big this fucking block is? Yeah. Yeah? You know how much people live in there? Five of us. Nothing's going in for them. After school, if they don't make it, they ain't made it. That's what London's about, you know. Yeah? North West has been a war zone for time. What gap ranks am I lying? It's not a war zone down there? Yeah, I lie. What we ain't warring every summer? Every, like every summer it's not KG versus um versus um Moza. It's not it's not St Stonebridge versus this one. It's not what well, we don't we don't get licked down every every year. They don't give a fuck about us. This is the new shit now. Yes, 51 have been killed in a couple of months. Okay. What are we going to do about it? I only have one life to live. And I'm going to live it. I only have one love to give. And I'm going to give it. No matter what it takes. Shut your blood down. Shut up. Shut your mouth. Fuck you. Fuck you. I'm British Jamaican. In the fuck up. Fuck up. You never just see up. I am my mother. My mother did for mercy. We lived there five years. The Rokas, Somalis, Albanians, Pakistanis, my family. The house was divided into flats. We had a bedroom between the four of us, but the freshies had it worse. Looking through the door, you'd see five bunk beds cramped into a small room, and just as many in the next. Some smoked cheap hash in the yellow hallways, others stashed white in wallets, like my dad. We were left with empty shelves, looking out the window all night. One summer, the landlord gathered everyone outside and gave us two weeks' notice. He said his wife and Ghana called and wanted to divorce. None of us could complain to the council. Most were illegal anyway. 
So my dad and the Irish look came by in a white van, started stripping the house. They took everything, a cooker, a fridge, a washing machine. The landlord saw what was happening and chased after them, cursing, but it wasn't quick enough. Apparently there were complications with the divorce and the flats got abandoned. I hadn't been back since. I saw my first body at five. She was a family friend who lived below us. We heard wailing and came downstairs. Her face was flat on the floor, foaming at the mouth, eyes rolled back. They checked her neck for a pulse. The body was still warm. Ce devait être une marche, ce sera finalement du surplace. Il n'empêche, les initiateurs du rassemblement ont bel et bien réussi leur coup. Réunir des dizaines de milliers de personnes pour dénoncer les violences policières à l'égard des minorités. Il va dire la même chose que George Floyd. Je n'arrive plus à respirer. Je n'arrive plus à respirer. Je n'arrive plus à respirer. Ce sont les derniers mots de mon petit frère. Ils ont laissé mourir mon père sur le bitume de cette gendarmerie. Conflicto entre Armenia y Azerbaiyán. Las dos ex repúblicas soviéticas se encontraban el domingo al borde de la guerra tras el estallido de violentos combates entre fuerzas azeríes y separatistas de la región de nagorno karabaj apoyados por Armenia. Ambos países declararon la ley marcial en sus territorios y Azerbaiyán decretó el toque de queda en Bakú y otras ciudades. <tose> El régimen dictatorial de Ilham Aliyev ha retomado las hostilidades. Es una guerra impuesta al pueblo armenio. Es una guerra contra nuestra independencia, libertad y dignidad. Nagorno Karabaj es una región separatista de Azerbaiyán de mayoría armenia que cuenta con el apoyo de Ereván. A principios de los años 90. Of course there's distance when we hear of a far off war, or even some kid that gets knifed a block away. We're used to thinking of death in terms of TV models and projection graphs. Thousands are coming every day, perishing in famine, liquidating in camps. The dying is enduring death in its essence. sunset, playing football on the road, running through the woodland strip, the ash and sycamore saplings. My death won't be a protest. I can't stand hypocrites and easy explanations. Self-pity has nothing to do with it either. You can't blame upbringing or politics. I did what I did. That's my life. London Borough of Brent. Over half the population is black or Asian. Unemployment is above the national average. 
In real terms, the redevelopment of Stonebridge has been a disaster incorporating all the problems associated with high density, high rise development. To be no more than a huge dormitory. The streets in the sky are menace, menace, an escape route for mothers and a playground for children who have nothing better to do. Stonebridge. Did they mean a disaster incorporating all the problems associated with high density, high rise noise transmits unhindered from one flat to another? One presumes that I community for 7,000 people without any amenities. Did they really imagine that people but rather pressures to be realistic about financial costs which change the whole scale? That now 80% of the people in the area are of West Indian extraction. Blacks, whites and Asians view each other with considerable suspicion and sometimes outright hostility. The Asian community see themselves as a prime target. We don't understand! Oh, anyone can read, can read the Bible, and yet they don't believe in the second coming of Christ. And when he shall come, our sorrows will be ended. When he shall come, no more crying. When he shall come, no more distress. When he shall come, no more crying. Praise God, the Bible said, the former things are past, and behold, all things become new. 81 is a crucial year for me because my brother and myself decided that we wanted to start living outside of the area or trying to develop something outside of the area because there weren't nothing happening around here. Everybody was just going to jail and it was just a no-go situation. If you worship the building, Jesus is coming. If you worship Jesus, he's coming again. So I started to develop something outside until I learned I was doing something within the area and I was forced to really come in and try and see what I could do. You know, it was only right for us to tell the youths where you're going, where you're coming from. Because I was out there in the wilderness, and out there in the wilderness, I seemed to be ashamed of coming to God. I felt embarrassed if people spoke to me about being good. And these were the things that I felt were totally out of my life, but then coming and finding God, which my parents was dealing with God before the day I was born. I can turn around today and feel happy that, no, I am not weak because I turn around and say that I want to follow God or no, I want to believe in no. God. I believe that I am strong That's because all of those who's out there who are still lost, mm. all they do is find themselves every day in the dark corners yeah. because it's a blind alley they're going down. And until they see the light and open up their eyes, they will not know when they are starting to go in the right way. Everything looks flat with insomnia. You can't tell dreams apart from reality. Usually I just go around unknown places, following rivers or roads. It was the only time I could clear my head. It became a ritual. I'd look at the thousands spilling onto the streets. Sometimes I'd go central and hang off bridges, staring into the Thames or stand at the edge of a train platform and think about jumping off. Feels wrong to you that. Help. I need somebody. Help. Help. Not just anybody. Help. Help. You know I need someone. Help. I've never needed anybody's help in any way. But now these days are gone, 
I'm not so self-assured. Every now and then, I, I feel, feel so insecure. insecure. Sometimes I feel it's better not to think about death. Between grieving and apathy, it'd be easier to love no one. But whenever we do, life becomes void. At seven, I came home one evening and dad left a note saying his body was in the garage. That's where mom started getting high. After dropping dirt on the coffin, I remember wondering if it was consecrated ground. For the last year, I've been returning to a grave in the old cemetery. It's a small gray stone at the back behind some bushes. The only others who see it are some crackheads who squat nearby, getting drunk off cheap beer and fermented milk. It goes against my instincts to clean it. We should respect death. It's unnatural to preserve appearances. But for some reason, I kept coming back once a week at night, removing the syringes and the beer cans. I don't know if suicide is a sin. Of course, the church condemns false martyrs. Carthaginians used to beg for execution, but it still has a tension between denying the world and striving after it, conflating sensual with spiritual suffering. Suffering when endured 
in the name of love, for the sake of love, ultimately for the sake of God and of men in a personal way, is redemptive. In the epistle to the Corinthians, when he speaks of love and says that even if I gave my body to be burnt but had no love, it would be vain and empty. I think it is the love that makes, uh, gives meaning to the suffering. Otherwise, it's a purely physical event. And what? At the heart of the gospel, we find love and equality of love, which is such denial of self that will allow freely to lay down one's life, freely to undergo suffering, freely to substitute eventually one's own death to someone else's death. In the history of the last century we have so many examples of people who have chosen to give their lives in order to save another person. And when you choose to die, you may very well not die and remain a cripple, be an invalid, suffer a great deal, which in a way is a risk much more uh, painful to take. Life should be a celebration, but then life should not be marred by the condition of men in which we live in the face of a world of disharmony, of hatred, of mutual antagonism, of contrast and opposition, then suffering is inevitable and it can be turned into a redemptive experience. Suffering is always inherent to love in a world which is disharmonious, ugly, violent, aggressive, and so forth. He does not want to suffer. He wants us to love. Yet, he warns us, love means death. A shedding of blood, heart blood, or physical blood. Pain as pain cannot build character. A daring, a courageous way of facing pain does. And for instance, in present day medicine, I discussed that lately in uh, a medical group, the way in which people turn to a doctor to alleviate the slightest pain because they assume that they should never be in pain results that they can face pain less and less and when there is no pain what they can't face is the fear of it so that in the end people live in pain although there is no pain yet when you love someone you don't mind walking two miles rather than one if say a mother has got a sick child she sits throughout the night and she doesn't feel virtuous. She couldn't help it. The same is true about carrying one another's burdens. And the heaviest burden, perhaps, is the peculiar personality which one has got to carry, one's own or someone else's. If you love the person, it's no exertion. It may be completely sacrificial. It may be as good as shedding your blood. But you don't do that grudgingly, and you don't speak of suffering, you speak of love. And I think that when Christians or non-Christians begin to speak so insistently on suffering, they are indirectly saying, I haven't got enough love to do it with joy. It is not celebration, it's pain. Well, the very possibility one may have to give one's life, one's energies, one's concern for another is celebration in itself, even when it involves physical or pain or moral anguish. His life and death were such a demonstration of perfect, self-forgetting love and such an act of faith in us 
I think both are essential. On the one hand, we see in him an incredible depth of love. As he puts it, no one is taking my life from me. I give it freely. And this is something which very few would do. But on the other hand, why it hits at us is that it isn't given for his own sake, as it were, but because he believes absolutely that his life and death are not in vain and that there is enough in us to respond to it. There were 23 soldiers in that desert to my surprise. All 23 have raped a single woman, me. When I screamed, they would suffocate me. After days of rapes and beatings, she describes how the soldiers tied her up, shoved items inside her and left her in the bush. In a Tigray hospital, her doctor, George Girme, lays out objects that were removed from the 27-year-old's vagina. Removes the equipment, like nail, stone, plastic, and uh, some cotton, like, and uh, heavy bleeding at this time. Roughly 260. 260, yes. In this clinic alone? Yes, okay. there is a war till now. 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 They are not knowing the person who raped, but as a group. They get as many diseases. They acquire many diseases, like HIV, like hepatitis, like STI. They're in the transportation. They come by themselves to work. After three days, after four days, after a week, they become very angry. They haven't had have any clothes. They are migrants. They haven't had have any financial. They have not any clothes. Their clothes are disorganized by the sharp materials, by knife, by anything when they are raped the persons. They cry with them in the center. They become damaged our minds. This is not, uh, this is heavy to understand. I keep having this dream where I'm wandering in winter. There's a grey tree in the distance and fog on furrowed fields and a stream that splits the meadow and the scent of ash and dust on the white path. I feel like I'm going to collapse into the earth and I bury my face in the dirt. And as I look up, there's a body bound to the tree with birds eating the flesh and dark blood on the brow. And I wash my face in the stream. And my parents are calling from the other side to join them. And it's so natural every time. And after waking, I believe it. There's a passage from Kierkegaard where a fire breaks out backstage in a crowded theatre before the performance. One of the actors tries to warn the audience, but he's dressed as a clown, and they think it's a joke. The louder he shouts, the more they laugh and cheer. That's how the world's gonna end.
Thus saith the Lord, Go and get a potter's earthen bottle, and take of the ancients of the people, and of the ancients of the priests, and go forth unto the valley of the son of Hinnom, which is by the entry of the east gate, and proclaim there the words that I shall tell thee, and say, Hear ye the word of the Lord, O kings of Judah, and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place, the which whosoever heareth, his ears shall tingle. Because they have forsaken me, and have estranged this place, and have burned incense in it unto other gods whom neither they nor their fathers have known, nor the kings of Judah, and have filled this place with the blood of innocents, they have built also the high places of Baal, to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings unto Baal, which I commanded not, nor spake it, neither came it into my mind. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that this place shall no more be called Tophet, nor the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. And I will make void the counsel of Judah and Jerusalem in this place, and I will cause them to fall by the sword before their enemies, and by the hands of them that seek their lives. And their carcasses will I give to be meat for the fowls of heaven, and for the beasts of the earth. And I will make this city desolate, and unhissing, every one that passeth thereby shall be astonished, and hiss because of all the plagues thereof. And I will cause them to eat the flesh of their sons and the flesh of their daughters, and they shall eat every one the flesh of his friend in the siege and straightness wherewith their enemies, and they that seek their lives shall straighten them. Then shalt thou break the bottle in the sight of the men that go with thee, and shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Even so will I break this people and this city, as one breaketh a potter's vessel that cannot be made whole again, and they shall bury them in Tophet, till there be no place to bury.
Now I'm ready. Nature's become more intense. You probably found that funny. Perception gets blunted with time. Life turns into habit. Words degrade to slogans, stock phrases, euphemism. Life just feels empty. I don't upset you, but I'm not gonna lie either. It's nothing but constant nausea. Today I woke up and started coughing blood. Most of the time I can't get out of bed. I haven't slept or eaten in days. Still, I have to finish this note. There are many quite ordinary things in electronics that we take for granted. For example, a microphone. I speak into the microphone and my voice is amplified. In space, 1980. We can send spacecraft containing people across 250,000 miles of space and bring them back again because we have developed accurate control systems. A new breakthrough in space flight. A test model of an American space shuttle is taken 7,000 meters high and released. The world's first spacecraft, equipped with wings and landing gear, starts its gliding descent to a landing. We control spacecraft and their direction in space, the living conditions in space, as well as soft landings on the moon and rendezvous in space. These control systems allow the correct behavior to be preset and then adhered to. Furthermore, if things go wrong, At the cybernetics department at Reading University in England, they make filters for space probes. Layers of material are condensed on top of each other. Each layer is only a few thousand molecules thick, and you can't measure that with a ruler. So what can measure molecules? A beam of infrared light. It's shone on the filters as they're being laid down. Some is absorbed, some reflected. How much depends on the thickness of the layer. If you can measure the amount of light returning, you also have a measure of the layer's thickness. You can then control the cycle and shut it down. Few people have the experience to make instruments able to measure energy at this level. The reason the filters are made here and nowhere else. Instrument physics, too, is part of cybernetics. The filters are fitted to telescopes in space probes. They sift infrared energy, letting only given wavelengths through to the instruments which analyze them. Everything gives off energy, even dead places like Mars. It can tell you about the chemical makeup of space, the solar system, even about life elsewhere. Cybernetics is the science of whole systems, and since everything is part of the system, from atoms to galaxies, it's universal. Our bodies are cybernetic systems in their own right. Very good. So you can see by the number of green dots there that you've succeeded in keeping the muscle tension within the correct range. Okay, what we're going to do is put this pad under your heel on your right foot. Mm -hmm. The light comes up onto the number nine. Likewise, with the lady learning to walk again. Consciously, she doesn't know when she's taken the right step. The machine knows, however, and lights up when she gets it right. Will you wait there on that leg? Yeah. All right. Yes, he will, by Richardson, a moment ago, down and injured. My first impression was of darkness, 
I suppose it was all the ashes that were thrown up in the air. As it cleared up, you could see people in waves coming and they were burned. You could not tell which was their face or which part their back. It seemed they were in a daze. Most of them were stunned, many were crying. Mothers carrying their half-burned children. The mothers themselves were burned more than half of their bodies. Skin hanging from the child, skin hanging from their own bodies, practically to the ground. This afterthought that smoke from nuclear war would have a serious effect on sunlight and climate had never been investigated by scientists, as Paul Crutzen was amazed to discover. He calculated that in a nuclear war, an area of forest the size of Scandinavia would be set on fire and produce 100 million tons of smoke. Of course, cities would burn too, as San Francisco did in 1906. There were some great things she used to do with her tongue, and now we're not together anymore. I miss her so much. She used to put it right down. That's an awakening. I found as my body decays, I'm able to perceive things more clearly. Before, every day was a void, bleeding into the next. Now I'm at the end, I feel every moment passing. I don't think I've ever understood someone else, or been understood. It's like I've been exiled. I know what I'm doing is gonna hurt people. I'm sure some are going to be glad as well. You made the last few years a lot easier. It's not your fault. It's nobody's. Even though I'm free doing what I'm doing, it feels unavoidable. You know I still love you. Vague memories. Nothing but memories. But in the grave, all, all shall be renewed. The last stroke of midnight dies. All day in the one chair, from dream to dream, and rhyme to rhyme, I have ranged in rambling talk with an image of air. Vague memories. Nothing but memories. I call it death in life and life in death.